Hey, what's going on, everybody? Thank you for tuning into the 3DMJ podcast. I am really excited to introduce Mike Tushare, Bryce Lewis, and Greg Knuckles. We had a fantastic discussion uh, at this year's European Powerlifting Conference about individualization and programming. Uh, I put this on the AEO YouTube video a while back, but it was so good we just had to put it on the podcast. Uh, these are some of the best coaches and programmers in the game of powerlifting, and you just won't find conversations like this. So make sure you tune in, take notes, listen to it twice, because you know I did. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you enjoy. What's going on, 3DMJers? I am here with three people after the EPC 2018, that's the European Powerlifting Conference. Uh, you probably have no idea who these gentlemen are. No, I'm just kidding. If you do, that's a travesty. This is Greg Knuckles, this is Bryce Lewis, and this is Mike Tushir. These are probably three of the most respected people in powerlifting when it comes to programming, coaching, and actually being competitive athletes. So I have the pleasure today to have him here to talk about uh, anecdotes and observations. We're going to be discussing some of the systematic approaches that Mike T uses called emerging strategies of looking at anecdotes and observations in a way that can be really useful towards programming. So once again, that's anecdotes and observations. That's AO pronounced AO. Perfect. So first, Mike, do you think you could give us a high level summary of, of what emerging strategies is? Yes. It's, it's a systematic way of do, going through the individualization process. So, um, I guess just to, to keep it as short as possible, uh, in a normal training block, uh, which we call development cycle, you would take one microcycle worth of training, which is usually a training week, and you repeat it over and over. Um, so that's the same exercises, the same sets, the same reps, the same RPE. So you get small fluctuations in the load, but that's the only thing that changes from one week to the next. And you just monitor the athlete's results. As long as the results are going up, you keep doing what you're doing. Uh, when the results stop going up, then you go into what we call a pivot block, which you can, for now, you can just think of as a deload. Uh, and then you go into a new development cycle that's fundamentally different, different exercises, different volumes, intensities, and, and so on. Uh, you, can, you learn a lot of things from it. You learn how long does it take an athlete to go from the start of a development cycle to this peak condition, uh, which seems to be a fairly stable number. Uh, within, which, within an individual? Yeah, yeah. It's fairly stable to that individual. So if it's six exposures, then it's six exposures for the next block and the next block and the next block as well. So it's useful for timing. And over time, you also can develop a picture of what that athlete responds best to, uh, which intensities get them the best results, which uh, volumes get, uh, yeah, volumes, intensities, exercises, things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's helped me a lot throughout the individualization process. But one, one reason why I was... Uh, why I'm excited to talk to you guys about it is I always say that you know all ideas have weaknesses and if you don't know what the weakness of an idea is then it's just a blind spot mm -hmm. and if I'm a coach in the real world then having a blind spot is going to be not a good thing so right. uh, I think I know what some of the weaknesses are to it but at the same time I'm always kind of wanting to know more about that. You know? Well, dude, first I just want to say I, I tremendously respect that you're like, hey, let me just on camera expose any potential, <laughs> you know, holes in my system. You yeah. know, I think that's a true sign of someone who's trying to do right by their clients and use the collective intelligence of the lifting community to improve. Well, I'll just ask you not to post it. Right, yeah. So <laughs> if you're seeing this, right. he came out looking better than he does in actuality, right? right? So... Um, <laughs> So yeah, Bryce, we, we were talking a little bit. I wonder if you could share what you might think some of the uh, potential blind spots might be in, in the system, if you think there are some. Um, sure. Like, when I kind of first heard about it, I was like, oh, this is different. I don't like it. <laughs> um, and like, I kind of threw up some natural resistances, but I think, I think Mike has a ton of sound ideas here. Like, number one is trying to find signal in the noise, and I think that's something that all good strength coaches are trying to do, trying to find out, okay, with with everything going on, 
what are the things that are actually working for the athlete and how can we measure those and, and kind of identify those things because presumably we want to do more of those things and less of the things that don't work um, as time goes on. Um, of a few things, one thing I, I'm curious about Mike's thoughts and your guys' thoughts too is um, I remember you saying over the weekend that oftentimes you've got to ride out a certain um, configuration of a week for a few weeks before you can figure out what works or what doesn't. And if you're already waiting a few weeks to figure out what works or what doesn't, what's the difference between doing that and allowing for weekly variation before figuring out um, what the, what the what's working and what isn't? Well, my thinking is that you just would never know. If you have it, enough weekly variation, you would just never know which of the stimuli is causing the effect that you that you see? Sure. So, something that I notice is you give this development cycle and you see it through to the end. There's usually one of three response types. Uh, type one, and, and all this stuff that I learned from Derek Evely, who learned it from Bondarchuk. So, uh, and it seems to hold for powerlifting as well. So the type one is is just a steady increase in in results throughout the development cycle. A type two has a dip uh, in performance in the early stage, and then a steady increase from there. Uh, and then a type three is relatively stagnant performance throughout most of the development cycle until the very end, where you might get a dip, uh, but there's a spike in performance. So it's really the type three that kind of throws a wrench into things. Because if everybody was a type one, you could just you could just look at like each exposure, right? Like I, I did fives last week and I'm better this week, therefore fives are good for me. But it's that type three response where you may be stagnant for eight weeks and then have a spike at the very end that, that kind of throws a wrench into things. <clears throat> Question for you guys. Like, are there any physiological reasons why there would be such extreme different types to exposure to strength training? So why would some people need a different number of exposures or even have a different pattern to, Patterns, yeah. to, to how they, they progress? That um, I could speculate, but I wouldn't be confident in, 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 in any of them. You know, I think, uh, I think that, that that's one of the, the whole points of, of, of talking about anecdotes and observations. It's like... Eh, is it wor even worth speculating? Like, it might be if that actually might change your decision. Yeah. But I think we're we're so far from knowing all the different pieces that go into that that I'm not sure it'd be useful. I don't know. What do you yeah. think? No, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So to the kind of piggyback on what you were saying, Bryce, I was thinking I also had a natural resistance, and I think probably just for for those of you who are following to get an idea of probably why that natural resistance occurred is technically, if you're not modifying uh, load. If it's just RPE, and if you're keeping the same sets and reps, it's not technically periodized within the mesocycle. Um, which, while none of us are have the illusion that periodization is like the magic, amazing key that it could be, and we definitely uh, understand that it has limitations, and Greg has written about them. Um, to have a completely unperiodized plan, especially for elite level powerlifters, is counterintuitive. Now, that's not to say that I don't think emerging strategies isn't periodized because you have multiple blocks that are different. Is that accurate? Yes. So if anything, it's like a auto-regulated reactive block periodized model. Yeah. Is, it, is that an accurate characterization? Yeah, I would, I would say so. So the, the way that the block sequence works out is after you start to develop this picture of this works well for an athlete, uh, say you take whatever it is that's most effective and that's what you put immediately before the competition. What's second most effective? Well, that's what goes in the block before that. And you rarely find yourself trying to string together more than two, maybe three blocks, because more than that, the unpredictability just kind of gets out of hand. Um, something always happens, you know. Right. Um, so you string together two or three of you know your most effective blocks, and that could be. And, and is, for the average power lifter, a, what you would see is a linear progression, like the intensity gets higher. Because most power lifters respond well to that, which yeah. is why that's, in my opinion, that's why that's common practice. Um, but some don't. Some have negative reactions to high intensity uh, and really positive reactions to something else. Well, 
if you have a negative reaction to high intensity, why would you do that before a competition? Um, well, you wouldn't, obviously. But my problem was I was never able to see that before I started looking at it in this way. Uh, I had an athlete for a number of years, and we would train, things are going great, and then we get close to the competition, and things just kind of fizzled. You know, sometimes you get these little nagging injuries, and when we started doing this emerging strategies thing, I, I noticed it's like every time we touch high intensity, that's when it happens, so let's just not do that. You know, and that worked great, but it presented some other problems, so it became this game of trying to find what's just the minimum amount of high intensity stuff we can do so that we know where your strength is at and then we go into the meet and have actual good attempt selection so it wasn't really a strength development thing it was more of a tactical thing right just just to clarify here real quick if you if you were going through this process and you try a lower intensity approach maybe auto-regulated um how did you tell that someone was making better progress so were they hitting like sets of five at RP6 and, and the weight they were using was going up at a faster rate or something like that? Yeah, so I typically don't go that low RPE, but uh, and if I'm going to go really low percentage, then there will be a benchmark somewhere in there. Yeah. So maybe they'll do a set of five at a nine RPE, but that's one set and the bulk of their work is 70% or something like that. So we can benchmark the performance off of the harder set but the bulk of the work is done somewhere else, the easier set. That may be one tactic that you would use. Okay. Um, so that benchmark set is kind of what allows us to, to gauge the progress with a relative uh, yeah. degree of accuracy. I was having a hard time picturing, like, where's the thermometer in this yeah. system? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think my reservations are primarily practical. Um, conceptually, I like the idea, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, practically... Each one of these developmental blocks is, what, like five to eight weeks or something like that? On average, yeah. So let, let's just say the only variables we're dealing with are volume, RPE, frequency, and exercise selection. And within each of those variables, there's four or five levels of them that you could test all independently, which would be, you know, like hundreds or thousands of possibilities. Um, So, like, obviously, you're not testing all of those. Right. Because you'd have to work with a lifter for centuries. (laughs) Uh, So, like, just kind of practically, how do you know that you have hit on something that is the best for that lifter? Or do you just kind of go until you find something that works and assume that it's good enough? I I don't think you can know. Mm -hmm. I think you know that it's better than anything you've tried so far. Fair. So I, I have a, a, I would call it a balance between like exploring development cycles mm-hmm. and focus development cycles. So if we're training for a major comp, then it's focus. It's something that we have good reason to believe this should work. But if we're further away, hey, let's explore a little bit. This We think this will work. Mm-hmm. Hey, this seems fun. Let's try it and see what your reaction is. And you can use... I, I think you can use past experience to inform some of that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, let's say you tried triples and that wasn't so good, and then you tried fives and that was a bit better. Well, maybe try eights, mm-hmm. you know, and it's is it better still, you know, and, and does it keep pushing you in that do, direction? Do results get better than fives? <laughs> That's the, the pinnacle, actually. <laughs> the, I believe it's pronounced fives. Fives. <laughs> Indeed. Um, Okay, so, but before you before you okay. move on, I, I, you you hit on a thing that I think is, it's, it's a weakness in this system, but it's a weakness in all systems that mm-hmm. there's a there's a hard problem of data mm-hmm. here that you collect data and no matter how much data you collect, it's got a shelf life. Yeah, because the lifter that you are now is not the same lifter you were two years ago. So how valid? Are those trials? Yeah, that, that's actually exactly what I was going to ask yeah. next. Um, so, like, when you're planning, when you're planning for a meet, mm-hmm. and you want to run the best developmental cycle right before the meet, like, how recent does that developmental cycle have to be? Uh, good question. I mean, the more you you so say you run development cycle X, and 
and get a good result. Well, the more you run development cycle X, the less true that's going to be because you you start to acclimate to that stimulus. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, if you never use it, then it's still going to have you're still going to expire at some point. Yeah, yeah. you know. So it's difficult to manage, and I, and I think that's kind of the the give and take that you have to to work with to to try to manage that. But the analogy that I came up with, I don't know if it's a good one or not, but I think finding the ideal individualized plan is like trying to find your way through a cave in the dark. Mm -hmm. um, and something like this, a tool like this, it doesn't light up the whole cave mm -hmm. uh, because there's things that you, you just can't try all the variables. So it's a little pen light, mm -hmm. you know, and you can maybe see a few things around you. The other problem is the rocks in the cave move around from time to time. You know, mm -hmm. like we're saying that you're not the same athlete that you were. So it doesn't solve the whole problem of perfectly individualizing a, a plan, but I would rather have a pen light than no light at all. Mm -hmm. um, which, to be fair, that's kind of, maybe that's where I was before mm -hmm. doing this, but I don't think that's where you guys are. Right. You know, I think... I think that was kind of a false assumption that I had when I was first doing this. I'm like, does nobody else see this? You know, but mm -hmm. but you guys have, and you've got a different approach to it. That you're not changing variables as drastically as as maybe I was, or maybe a lot of other coaches are uh, within the the training block. So you do get a better sense of what an athlete's response to a given stimulus is. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought that was cool. Yeah. Yeah, so I think on that specific point of what your preconceptions were going into it, I think that's important to give some context around it. So for one, when you got into the game, the west side approach was big. Yeah. And I would, to try not to put them down too much, I think the, the average person who saw themselves as a west side practitioner would use what I would describe as randomization and call it variation. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that they were changing things so frequently and so significantly and without an, any kind of orderly fashion to it, on average, not everybody, uh, that they were inherently not able to see the forest for the trees. Yeah. Um, and they didn't even have that pen light. Um, likewise, I think it's also important to point out that you work with a ton of extremely high-level athletes. So in, in that case, um, the question of good, better, and best is actually those become much more narrow. So, for example, if Bryce Lewis improves his total at all, I'm actually pretty confident we're close to optimal yeah. because he, just seeing progress at that right. point, is very near it. So I think those two things will probably help someone understand how you landed on this and why it's working well for your athletes because if they're improving at all, it's close enough to optimal for it not to matter the distinction between it and what might be better. Right. Um, on that same topic of preconceptions and potential biases that someone has coming to the table, I think the biggest weakness to it that I see is that there are baked in biases and that you can only observe the ways of modifying training that you would modify. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess I just want to open that up broadly, like how far are you willing to step outside of the Mike T bubble to observe new things to know how close you could be getting? Maybe I, I can answer what I think you're asking, and then you can tell me if I'm close. Cool. <laughs> All right. I like to collect different strategies. Um, so, like, like I have my way of doing things, and we talked at the conference today about, you know, I often include assistance and in supplemental exercises in different categories. But I also like to understand how somebody like you would program things and, and see what those differences are or, or of, uh, you know, I, I look into different camps and, and see like, well, what situation might I use this in? Mm -hmm. And cause you can build a strategy around any of that. Like you could build a strategy around just comp lift only if you wanted to do that. Or like, I, I don't think that like the, the emerging strategy concept is a, is a framework. Right. And I really don't, there, there's only a few limitations that you would have. Like you can even include variation uh, within that as long as it was a pattern that repeated with some regularity. Now, if it's a 10 week long pattern, then you never really, that's too much to be manageable, you know? Right. Uh, but you know, if you had a, a alternating weeks, you can do that. And we, we do 
do that with some athletes. Some athletes have a great response to that type of thing, but that's you know, kind of veering off topic maybe, but that's not the default of yep. where we start usually, you know, yep. is that even close? So, so, <laughs> so like to kind of use an extreme example, um, if you notice that one of your lifters just responded really well to high intensity work, do you think you'd ever find yourself at the Bulgarian system? Like I, I, if I understood Eric correctly, like it seemed like he was asking, like not not like necessarily you just followed the data. Yeah, like not necessarily just what variables are you willing to touch, but more like how far out of the how, sphere of what you typically do would you be willing to venture? I think you could end up at the Bulgarian system now. Whether I'm let's take a theoretical athlete that we can look at our crystal ball and say that is the best way. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm a good enough coach to follow to get to that answer, mm -hmm. yeah, right. you know, but that's the other thing that, that I see as maybe a potential weakness to it, but I'm not even so sure that it's a weakness. Mm -hmm. It really emphasizes coaching skill. And I think that's a thing that doesn't get talked about enough, that there is absolutely a skill component to being a good coach. And some coaches are good at it and some aren't. And some people just have a knack for it and some people don't. Mm -hmm. And it's not about just the program. You know, now, I, yeah, and I don't know if my skill is enough that I can get that far out of what I would normally do. Mm -hmm. uh, but in theory, you could. So that makes a lot of sense to me. So what you're saying is the emerging strategies strategy for, for lack of a better framework word. Is, framework yeah. thank you is, is a framework that any coach could use yes. given the, uh, the, the, the the data set uh, given the analytical tools you have um, and that it could be shittier or less shitty depending on how 100%. how much you pay attention and how wide of a net you're willing to cast mm -hmm. and how appropriately you're willing to cast that net so even if that is a weakness of the system um, it's not a different weakness than any other style of programming. Well, that, that's the that's the thing I keep coming back to, and, and like we started talking about weaknesses in the system, the ones that I found, I'm like, yeah, that's that's a weakness to the system, but I don't see how that's a weakness that doesn't exist in other systems. Right. It's just that I think it tries to meet it head on. You know. So here's one thing I'm considering: is that any system that uses this probably needs to employ auto regulation or some way of allowing for change in load week to week because that's that's the key thing that's changing. Well, you could. Uh, it, so as Bonnerchuk coached throwers and had people lifting, he used a fixed load uh, approach. Um, and the idea was, well, as you got stronger during the course of the development cycle, you would lift faster. Okay. okay. So you could do that. I mm -hmm. haven't dabbled in that. Sure. Yeah, so yeah, you just need something to gauge the temperature, like you said, Bryce. Right. Yeah. So you could have velocity of a fixed load. You could have an AMRAP on, yeah. on a fixed load. Or you could have an estimated 1RM based on RPE like you do. Right. Um, and I'm aware of some people who've tried this with AMRAPs and found it to be successful. Like, I thought that, well, you're going to get different reps, and so that's kind of a different stimulus. I don't know if that's going to work, and they said it seems to work just fine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a relatively small portion yeah. of the stimulus. You right. Know? I mean, it is more than a single at 8 RPE. Yeah. Uh, but but it certainly wouldn't be the bulk of it. So I would think it would be a reasonable temperature gauge. Right. Really quick favor, guys. If you enjoy these shows and have been a listener for quite some time, we would really, really, really appreciate it if you could take the time to give us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever your preferred podcast app may be. Having lots of ratings and audience feedback makes our show become more visible across multiple platforms, and it supports our mission of helping as many people as we can to be the best athletes, coaches, and lifting enthusiasts that they could possibly be. So if you're not driving and it wouldn't be dangerous, pause this thing right now and give us an honest review over on your podcast app, and we would love you even more than we already do. Thanks for taking the time, and we hope you enjoy the show. One thing I think is, like, there are there's a range... Uh, a probably wide range and, and maybe narrow as an athlete gets more um, developed and, and more elite, but there's a probably wide range of programs, period, uh, like plural, that an athlete can respond really well to. And if an athlete is making progress, we're probably not going to be searching the field too wide for what, what can be making more progress. Yeah. Pro athletes making progress, fantastic. Um, but, but that's true of, of any system, really. That's yeah. not like a, an emergent strategies thing. Well, I would like to 
I think that would be an interesting thing to know at some point is like for a given say Wilk score what's a what's a reasonable rate of gain for that person you know just on the average and of course that gets individualized too some people are born with a 460 Wilkes yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> well and and then get stronger rapidly and mm-hmm. then some people just don't yep so I can send you a data set if you want to look into that yeah that would be cool um yeah, like you can just go on open powerlifting, mm-hmm. uh, download everything, um, filter based on the criteria you want. So like, you know, maybe only drug tested feds or like only IPF affiliates, mm-hmm. um, and then sort uh, alphabetically. See how many people show up in the database multiple times, and then calculate rates of progress. Yeah, um, and you can see kind of at various levels of strength yeah. how that changes. Yeah. I- I think that would be cool to to know that, you know. So, um, one one potential limitation of this strategy that I think may be not necessarily unique to it, but maybe isn't present in more common strategies, um, is I'm not entirely sure how you'd account for second order effects. So let's say um, let's say you run a developmental cycle. It's a type three response. Doesn't look like it's going all that well. Run a pivot block. Uh, go to another developmental cycle. It's a type one response. Looks like it's awesome. Um, very potentially, something in that first developmental cycle could have potentiated the second one. Yeah. And now you've um, got periodization. Yeah. And it. <clears throat> Like, I think if you're using, like, a block periodization paradigm and you have, like, you know, uh, like, volume blocks and intensity blocks and you see, like, oh, if I run an intensity block after a volume block, it does really well. But if I run two intensity blocks back to back, the second one doesn't do that great. So it seems like the volume block is potentiating the intensity block. If you if you have, like, a, a decent number of developmental cycles in the mix... Um, how would you be able to tease that out without not just running a fair amount of developmental cycles, but running the same one like three or four times? Well, <clears throat> kind of the, the reason that I started calling this emerging strategies was because it starts with small, you know, you start with the microcycle, let's figure out the volumes, intensities, and so on that you respond well to. But in theory, you should be able to go up from there once we've got that sorted we should be able to figure out the next level and the next level. And eventually, you know, a long-term plan that is optimized to an individual. Now that's not going to happen because by the time you figure that out, it's the Theseus ship problem, you know? Yeah. Um, but I think, it, well, also what's going on to figure any of this out with any sort of degree of certainty, because you're not, there's no control group or anything like that going on. So you're taking a really a Bayesian approach to, to your certainty levels. You know, you try once and floor presses look like they did awesome. Well, that's one time, you know, so the next trial, like, uh, I don't know that, that one didn't go so well. So it's like the more data points that you get on floor press, the more certain you can be of it. Mm -hmm. Um, but Again, hopefully, once you've kind of established that smaller cycle, then you can start to figure out how the the sequences fit together. But it is a lot more difficult to move up a level. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's relatively easy, I think, to figure out what what's going on at that uh, that first level. Mm-hmm. But to move up a level and figure out the the ideal sequence of blocks, and there's there's other things that um, are kind of counterintuitive that I would place in that second level mm-hmm. as well. Um, and they're not coming to mind right now, which is convenient, but, um, it's been th- a long day. <laughs> things like template changes mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Like that's really at that second level as well. Um, because if you change the template, but you're using a bunch of exercises and intensities that aren't going to produce results for you, then like, eh, it's, you're probably not going to see anything anyway, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's. I think you're right. I think that's a limitation to it that you're not going to get uh, 
kind of that mid or long term plan that's that's like perfectly figured out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, can you get that anyway? Like maybe on the average, but I, I don't think that there's a rejection of exercise science in it. You know, mm-hmm. that what we learn from exercise science informs, like fills in those gaps that we don't know uh, from individualized data yet. And I think that makes it a, a really reasonable place to start most of the time. So one of the things, like I think the approach does well, and, and maybe even one of the, the reasons to to think about it in the first place is like, you know, look, we don't want the Soviet model, we don't want a long term model, we don't even like why assume that a, a four week slash deload, or a four week followed by deload followed by four week followed by deload with increased intensity works for everyone. That it might be a good place to start, but why would we assume that in the first place? So let's start with kind of first basic principles. Um, I really like that idea, but at some point we have to put down on paper what we think the athlete is going to be doing in the gym and telling them what to do in the gym. We have to tell them, okay, how, how often do I want you to squat, to bench, to deadlift? So like, what is, what is this basic building block that we're starting off with? And, and you've chosen the micro cycle or, or the week. Um, but but even within that, you've decided based on um, some intuition or athlete history or um, your experience working with the athlete, okay, I think the athlete is going to squat, bench, and deadlift X, Y, and Z times, mm-hmm. and I think this selection of exercises works best with them. So that's kind of that's kind of where first basic principle steps off and coach, coach comes in and says, this is the plan for now until we have better information. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's a great spot where you know, we can say, well, you know, the data shows that, you know, this frequency works best or, or you know, for most people most of the time. And, and uh, you know, I, I've done a little dabbling with some other things like 80% rep tests and stuff like that to try to get a, get a little bit better starting point, mm-hmm. you know, but it, it was interesting to me to look at that type of data and see how many exceptions there are, you know, Mm -hmm. like, yeah, there's an overall trend, but there's so many exceptions, you know, you may just be one of those exceptions, you know, but I guess it's, I think a lot more people are exceptions than realize like like on the whole, right? Yeah. yeah, Nobody's average at everything. Yeah. Like I think, Mm -hmm. I think people underestimate just variability period. Mm -hmm. Um, like if if there's something that works best on average, um, you know, I, I I think a lot of people interpret that as this is the best thing for ninety percent of people, whereas it might be the best thing for thirty percent of people and works well enough for the other seventy sure, percent that sure. they don't drag down the average. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, and I, I think I think that that um, I think the difference and the any critique or hesitation I have around your system is not actually the system, um, but it's actually the starting point, which is not an issue with the framework. Now, the more I think about it, uh, if you're starting with the pen light somewhere closer to the mouth of the cave, mm-hmm. I think I'm just comfortable and more confident starting somewhere that I think would be a little bit better for most people. Like I might have a, a volume and then a intensification block with some form of undulation and a little slightly different exercise selection because through my personal coaching history, I've seen that it, it, it mm-hmm. hits the vast, vast majority of people. And then from there I adjust because I'm trying to think back through my own coaching career and something that falls in that range seems to work for, at least in my experience, like 90% of people. Yeah, I think like, so the reason I asked about second order effects is I think that our general approach isn't all that different. Um, But I I start with a framework that seems to capture those second-order effects Mm -hmm. on average for most people and then kind of work back and kind of work on fixing the first-level stuff from there. Mm -hmm. Let me kind of turn a question around that you guys asked Mm me. Um, So one thing that, that I've done no more than a handful of times now is, is I, I find, end up finding one of these athletes that doesn't respond so well to high intensity, mm-hmm. the classic powerlifting peaking thing and responds much better to lower intensity. So we'll 
go into the meat with those low intensity blocks and it seems to work well in the frameworks that, that you guys use mm -hmm. can you arrive at that conclusion I think so so um, the way I tend to set things up is um, I'll have three very similar four to six week blocks but the first block's a little lighter second block's a little heavier third block's a little heavier um, and just basically see how squat bench and deadlift responds for that lifter in each of those three blocks. Uh, and so like, let's say deadlift does really good with lower intensity, bench does better with middle intensities, squat does better with higher intensities. Then from there, what I tend to do is like just build kind of a six week block of training that's going to have lower intensity deadlifts, moderate intensity bench, higher intensity squats. Some variation in there, but that's kind of where that like block lives. And we'll just run it back to back to back to back to back for a long time. Mm. Um, and still like iterating from there, yeah. but kind of having, having a framework I work with on the front end. And then once I run through that test, kind of using the data from that test to optimize for that lifter. It's funny because it sounds like, uh, you know, I have this framework and I'm like, man, can you guys believe this? This is so cool. And you're like, yeah, yeah I've been doing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we all have systems for like, uh, like parsing data and trying yeah. to figure out what's best for the athlete. Like I was thinking one way I arrived at is similar to what Greg said is, uh, you know, starting off with a lighter block. And if you find that like the weights are getting heavier week to week and the athlete is reporting lower and lower lasted RPEs, like this is a great training response. So you kind of just couch that in the back of your head and be like, okay, that's cool. Let's go on with, you know, things as normal. And then if things start to get worse over time, you notice, all right, well, things are getting worse over time. And it's, it's note taking, but just in a different way that, yeah. that you said, but real quick before I pass it on, um, I'm trying to think like, okay, where can I meet Mike and, and where, where's the similarity between what we're doing? And I'm thinking like, if I have a four week version of an emerging strategies thing, like that's perfect for me. You know, I, I get four weeks of periodization. I can test out a strategy for kind of an extended period of time. So like I, I realize like that's where I'm comfortable. It's kind of like basically just a, a slightly more periodized version of what you're already doing. So do a four week thing, see how things go over that period of time, evaluate what things are like, then decide, okay, what are the broad brush strokes of what I want to change and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, and, I'm, and just to kind of piggyback, I, I think uh, back in 2013 or 14, I sat down and I wrote 10 programs of different levels of volume. Uh, jokingly, we called them Helm, Helms Co. Um, uh, basically, different relative volume loads of the big three with kind of uh, eight week blocks, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and that was basically the framework for what became my training system. Um, and, you know, the cool thing about having Bryce here is that Bryce not only have I got to work with him since 2010, but he's got to work with me since 2010. And he remembers back to when I wrote, when I just told him to do Shiko that we modified way back in the day, to then when I started giving him West Side-ish inspired things I actually wrote, to then having RTS inspired RPE training, to then probably for the last four or five years, basically have playing his greatest hits, much like you do, but coming out of those uh, eight-week Helms Co templates that I wrote that I then use in the same way you guys are talking about to go like moving them up or down that ladder and seeing what works better. Um, and then obviously making a lot of other individual adjustments. So it's, um, it's, it's, it is less systematic than what you're doing just cause I, I don't, I know I don't use the same tools as you. Um, and I think I would like to think I make up for that by starting somewhere further down the cave, but that's completely based on my assumptions and where I've been before. Well, there's something that you've said a number of times today, and you said it just in this conversation, uh, is paying attention, yep. you know, and something that you talked about earlier today was like, how do you know when you're actually paying attention, but that's what this comes back to, to me, it's like, this is a framework that facilitates paying attention, mm -hmm. and it sounds like you guys all have frameworks for paying attention, and, and how do you figure this out? Like, well, you you look and you use your head and you figure it out, you know, mm -hmm. um, it sounds like that's kind of the, the central theme maybe. And, you know, you, uh, mentioned John Kiley during, during your talk today and, 
and uh, that's one of the big things that I've taken from uh, from listening to him is that that paying attention is more important than any of the the planning that goes into it. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. The the plan is the one that adapts to the athlete. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for sure. So I uh, I thought this would be cool to do because um, Mike has been gracious enough to expose himself to our potential criticisms. I think it's much easier to criticize something as blind spots than to potentially be constructive and figure out how it could be improved. So I'll put it to myself as well, so I don't just get to be the moderator who always looks smart or at least isn't exposed to criticism. Um, Bryce and Greg, can you guys think of any ways which, even if we don't know whether we have the technology to support it, because it sounds like you can do some cool shit, um, <laughs> are there ways that, that you, you see to improve upon what Mike's doing? I think so. So um, one, I am very much on board with almost everything you do, except for the lack of peaking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's the part I find the most counterintuitive. And that's also the part that seems to be the most testable within your framework. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's also kind of the most obvious second order effect that you could potentially tack on for added benefits. Okay. Um, so like if there's a developmental block that is consistently working well for a lifter, you could rather than running a pivot block after it, try out different peaking ideas yes. to see if you can like get a further elevation above that. Yeah. Um, and that, that strikes me. And I could be totally full of shit and you could be totally right that peaking doesn't accomplish anything. And if you time the meet to where they reach their peak form within a developmental block, that's as good as they're going to get. I, God, I don't. I just don't think that's right, though. I, like, I think there is something to peaking, and I think that peaking is something that would naturally fit into your system. Yeah. That would be kind of a small enough kind of addendum to a block that already works well that it would be testable. Yeah, and totally, totally agree. I think that the non-peaking way of doing it. So the the idea is just if you know that your uh, time to peak in a training block is six weeks, then you put the meat on the sixth week and you work backwards from there and that's how you figure out the start and and you rest two or three days prior and don't really do much taper. Uh, you train normally up to that point. Um, but you're right that that that's a reasonable place to start if you don't know anything else about them because I think the peaking or the, the traditional tapering uh, lends itself to more noise in the system, especially early on, um, when you maybe don't know that much about the athlete. But you're absolutely right that that's something that's pretty easily testable and potentially beneficial. And if you can figure out what exercises they're going to respond best to in a development cycle, there's no reason you can't figure out what type of taper strategy would work well. To that point, by the way, um, have you found that time to peak is like a durable quality for fives as it is for singles. Yeah. So like that's that's just kind of like a, a quality that exists for athletes. Like whether I have singles at eight or sets of five at eight, it's kind of a similar time before we start seeing a drop off in performance. It seems to be, which is kind of weird. It's kooky, you know. It, now it, there does seem to be a small range, right? So it, for me, uh, my time to peak is around six exposures. It might be five, it might be seven, you know, but it doesn't seem to be tied to anything in particular. I, I don't think that's all too kooky when I think about it, uh, given um, our metric for what performance is is always the same. We're trying to look at basically our estimated one around. We're kind of looking at the same quality each time. Mm -hmm. And if we accept some of the, the conceptual models like fitness and fatigue and things like that, I would think that kind of makes sense to me. Like, you know, we're doing enough to produce overload, which means we're also producing some kind of fatigue. Uh, we're trying to get the same outcome each time, so you would think we'd have a roughly similar time to, at least in a stable person's life, mm -hmm. right? All else being equal, we, we should see that. Um, so I think that makes sense, and I think that's actually kind of cool. Um, and I, I also actually had this, the same exact thought as, as Greg. Like, 
that was also one of the things. I think I brought that up to you. You did last year. I was like, look, man, papers work, okay? <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. To be honest, like that that conversation from last year has stuck out in my head the, the whole year, yeah. and there have been a, multiple multiple times when I have an athlete that's coming into a competition and if things don't look like they're progressing just how they normally would, you know, and you're just going to cruise right into this peak, then we'll implement a, a taper strategy to try to, to try to help it along. Sure. Um, and like I mentioned in, in the talk yesterday, uh, that the additional stress, the additional weight manipulation, everything that goes into a competition block, it seems like 50-50. You know, sometimes athletes seem to handle it and cruise right in. Other times they need it, you know, and, and then you have some athletes that just recover pretty poorly. Mm-hmm. And for them, I feel like it just makes sense, you know, yeah. but absolutely, it's something that's testable. Yeah. Okay. Do you have anything else, Bryce, on that point? Um, I was trying to think off, like, uh, what's my checklist of what's important in, in training? Like you have, you have periodization. It's just, it happens when you switch to a pivot, uh, or when you switch to a peaking block or something like that. Um, or when you switch from one development cycle that looks like X, Y, Z to another one, that's periodization in the same way that someone would have an eight week block and a different eight week block down the line. Yeah. Uh, which kind of takes care of some of the variation in, um, strain um, mm-hmm. because there's some variation as the year goes on plus I think the research on periodization was like a, sm- a small effect size like it's not massive anyways mm, depends how you slice it on, on elite athletes I think it was bigger there's no research on elite athletes <laughs> people who are not <laughs> untrained yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that's an accurate way to describe it sure we've got a metric to assess if an athlete's getting better we have a coach who hopefully has a system of being able to see uh, when that's happening. Um, responsive athletes as well. Like, and, and this is something that conceivably you could apply to any training approach. So I think I'm more on the same page with you than I thought I was like a month ago or even a few weeks ago as well after like kind of seeing what are the pieces actually here. Well, I think also... I bear some responsibility like you guys were talking about bristling at the idea in the beginning I bear some responsibility for that because uh, the way I couched it in the beginning is kind of this anti-periodization periodization is dead right my name is Mike right. T and I'm going to kill it <laughs> and it's not that right it, and the more I think about it the more like yeah there are limitations to it but and and that's maybe a reason to go toward a bottom up approach versus a top down approach, but it's still planning training. It's just from a different vantage point. Mm. Uh, and I think maybe my reasons for going this direction are more epistemological rather than anti periodization, which that's where I tried to focus, and, and I think I'll continue to try to focus now. Is just to me, it's it's more about how do I know what I think I know? Right. And can I, can I really support what I think? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think that's, that's a, that's a decent place to, to finish. I want to really thank you for taking the time and exposing yourself to criticism. I think, um, that's an admirable quality and I think, uh, we're all probably all better for it. Mm -hmm. I know I've learned a lot uh, this weekend and it's always just fun to talk about this stuff. I hope you guys enjoyed this as much as I did. And uh, if this is on YouTube, I know that at least uh, 90% of you have already left. So for the 10% of you who are here, you win. Thank you for staying around and I will see you next time on AO. Hey everybody, it's Eric Helms. Thanks for tuning into our podcast. As you know, at 3DMJ, we promote evidence-based approaches to the lifting community. If that's something you want to dive deeper into, I'd encourage you to check out my research review, Monthly Applications in Strength Sport or for short, MASS. This is a review that myself, Dr. Mike Zerdos, and Greg Knuckles put out every month. We cover the latest research publications that are applicable to strength and physique athletes, or anyone who's looking to get stronger or improve their body comp. Our content is in both written and video format. For more information on how to subscribe, check out 3dmusclejourney.com slash MASS. That's 3dmusclejourney.com slash M-A-S-S.
for further details. Thanks for tuning in.